of the service, today we celebrate Ascension Sunday, uh, which was actually Thursday, but they can't get that, that's, that's just the way it is, we have to deal with it, I shouldn't stop saying it, but uh, there you go. Um, we celebrate today that, that glorious fact as Christ's body gathered together. And I was thinking through the various themes we could reflect upon today. We could be looking at the affirmation from God of Jesus as he brought Jesus up to sit beside him in heaven at his right hand. We could be looking at the beginnings of the mission of the gospel that Jesus launched at that time. We could even look at the fact that even as Jesus went up to heaven, the promise of his coming again was given. But I was also thinking it was Mother's Day, as you'll see on the screen. That's my Mother's Day splash for you all. What is there about the ascension that links together with Mother's Day? Perhaps because some days mothers just feel like they need the ascension to get up out of bed and do it all again. But what could really link these two occasions together? I once saw a sign in front of a church, not far from here, uh, which said, God couldn't, be any, uh, sorry, God couldn't be everywhere, so he gave us mothers. Now, notwithstanding the fact that when you are little, it almost seems like your mother is the God of your universe, as nice as it may sound, it is just not true that mums fill in where God can't. Why? Because God is everywhere. God is always with us by his spirit. So I kept on thinking, what could tie these two occasions together? And finally I came up with the link. It was the perfect match of the two days. Why hadn't I seen it before? And finally it came to me, piano practice. It's probably familiar to you, I'm sure, but uh, certainly familiar to me. Because when I was growing up, I was like most impatient boys, I guess. There were times when mum would get me to do something for a time. It might have been a chore around the house, might have been homework, or something else that I didn't want, really didn't want to do for all that time, like piano practice. Of course, very soon I became bored and I started ask the, asking the inevitable question, is it time yet? When can I finish? I've played them all already. It must have been an eternity that I've been sitting there. Here is a, just a little reflection of how I felt. Not actually me. <laughs> so much did it feel this way that when I was doing my piano practice, mum would often sit behind me at the, on the lounge and read a book just to make sure I stayed on task. I'm sure she had a dozen other things to do, but she would stay there until I was done. Any other mothers found themselves doing similar things? Yep, I can view, see quite a few nods. Sometimes I would ask if I could finish, and she would say, when I finish the page... Now, Mum was an extraordinarily fast reader, but I swear that some of those pages must have been at least 10 metres long because they seemed to take forever. And I couldn't help but wonder what on earth she was doing there. Sometimes I did catch her reading those pages with her eyes closed, which I thought was miraculous. <laughs> so we circle back to Ascension, uh, Ascension Day. Jesus had been gone for a while now, and, then, and he has promised he will return. But what is he doing up there? What is happening in the meantime? Is he twiddling his thumbs? Is he playing card games with God to while away the days? What is he doing? Today's reading gives us a wonderful picture of Jesus' purpose in going to be with God. Let me just read that for you. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a, great, have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. Yet he did not sin. 
Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's just a great little gem in there, isn't it? Helen read it beautifully for us. So let's look at those things. Let's look at each one in turn. Firstly, we have Jesus as a great high priest. The priest in Jesus' days was the one who took the people's case for forgiveness to God. They were the ones who received the sacrifices of the people for God, for their sins. And they were the ones who would declare whether people were actually okay with God or not. Not that they had the power to forgive them, but that they had made the proper, uh, proper sacrifice. And the high priest, he was head of the lot. They led and instructed all the other priests in how to perform their tasks. They'd also perform sacrifices on behalf of the whole people, leading them in worship, but also seeking forgiveness for their sins. They were a gateway, if you like, for the people to relate to God. But Jesus, Jesus put much, much higher than that in the priesthood. He is the great high priest. There's never been a great high priest before. Certainly he's great because he's part of the Godhead. He he has all the power and authority of God the Father, who has given them to him, and he acts in accordance with God's perfect will. There is no one better as a person who could approach God on our behalf. No one else could be worthy in their own right than God's own son. So we have a great high priest. But in verse 15, it goes a little further. He is, he's also known an earthly existence. He has been there. He's been here. He knows what it's like to be human in all of its joy, and all of its hardship. Even more, he knows exactly what it is to be tempted in every way. He's one of us. Just imagine that. Jesus didn't somehow operate outside of our existence. He experienced it in all its fullness. And in that, he experienced temptation as well. More than we could possibly know. There is no temptation that you and I could know that he wouldn't have known first. You'd be tempting to think that Jesus was not tempted in the same way we were. After all, he was God. How could he possibly be tempted? But if you think about it, as God, he could also succumb to far more of those temptations than we could. And he could have done far more with them. We only need to go back to that night in the Garden of Gethsemane before Jesus was crucified. He so wanted not to die. What a horrendous thing to think that life could be taken from the very one through whom it was created. So when they come to arrest him, take him away to be tortured and killed, how easy would it have been for him just to protect himself? He had the power. He had the desire not to die. Instead, he only used that power to protect his friends, to heal one of the mob's ear, and was obedient, going all the way to the cross. There is no temptation that you and I could know that Jesus has not known first. And what's more, he knows us so well, so intimately, better than we could know ourselves. And because of that, he is placed placed as the one who pleads our, our case before God. He is not like some lawyer who goes to the court to represent someone they've just met. Completely oblivious to their life beforehand, trying to make up some story. He knows us, not just in his head, but in his heart. He is our brother, our Lord, and our friend. But then that last verse is quite amazing. 
Back in those days when one nation defeated another, they would sometimes bring the people before a, a king. There'd be a profession, a procession, I should say. Um, and uh, they would do that for a number of reasons. It could be because they're about to execute all the, all the enemies. They themselves could even be coming to plead for themselves before him. But the main reason a king would bring the vanquished people before them would be to humiliate them. The king will be showing what a mighty king he was and how pathetic they were, that they would even try to stand up against him. Their very survival was at his whim. He wanted them to see that they were at the bottom of the heap. Verse 16 gives us a very different picture. It's a picture of the way in which we are received day by day as we bring our sins before God. Because Jesus has been our sacrifice already. And he's gone before us to be that great high priest, bringing us a new covenant of forgiveness. This new covenant before God. So to finish, I want to do something a little different. I want to, uh, I've, um, I was thinking about it, and a, a word picture came, sort of came to my mind. So I'd ask you to uh, perhaps close your eyes or just do whatever you do to imagine or envisage this picture of what happens when we bring our sins before God in prayer and try to place yourself in the midst of it. I'm tired. No, I'm weary, almost to death from the fight. It's no small thing to try and battle against the creator of the creation in which you live, of which you are a part. And my heart hadn't even been in it. I knew what I had been doing wasn't right. And every time I tried to tell myself differently, somehow it cost me again. Ultimately, I knew I had to surrender. I had to plead for mercy from the same one that I'd rebelled against. I look up and I see the gates of God's kingdom. They are huge, so impressive and so bright. In my own darkness, I can barely dare to even glimpse at them. But at the same time, I can't turn away from them. My heart sinks. How can I possibly get in? The wall's so high and unassailable. So many angels along the wall, I suspect I'll be stopped well before I reach, reach my goal. But I'm compelled forward. My heart won't let me stand still. And as I do, I see the gates swing wide open. I feel naked as I look and see all the way to the throne. I finally step inside and immediately I'm knocked to my knees by the sheer power I sense as I enter. I expected to be sneaking inside some backwater or alleyway of the city. But if I thought the city was bright from outside, it is nothing compared to the light, the myriad colours, the absolute glory of what I see inside. So much so, it takes a few moments for my eyes to see clearly. Eventually I do. And what I see nearly knocks me flat again. There is an inviting warmth about me and I'm immersed in the, the scent of pure life like budding flowers and freshly mown grass. There before me are thousands of figures, all praising God. They are people, and their conversations are full of the amazing things that God has done. Some of the things I recognize, but many I do not. Some of them are earth-shattering stories of creation and salvation of thousands, millions. But others are of a small child here or an everyday person there. And each one of them is equally celebrated together as they praise God for what he has done. 
I can't help but thank God with them for all of these stories of his grace and power and most of all, his love. Finally, my gaze is drawn back to the throne. Immediately, my mouth goes dry. My body seems to stop every function as I expect to see this powerful God, amazing God. As much as I've heard these stories, I can't help but think that his face will be full of anger toward me for my pathetic rebellion against him. This can't end well. Instead, the room clears, and I see the path laid out before me, straight to the foot of the throne itself. And and although it's still a long way away, I see Jesus sitting next to God the Father in earnest conversation. I know immediately that I am the topic of a conversation. All my mistakes, all my hidden errors, even the ones I didn't know about. There are no sideways glances or whispered words. I can hear Jesus describing all that I am, all that I have done. I can feel myself melting into the ground, ashamed. But as he finishes, Jesus looks at me and says, I know, I know it all. I know the things you've done the hurt you have caused, and how grotty you have made yourself. And I know why. But I am enough. And you are a child of God, my sister or brother. I know you're not perfect, but you are still one of mine. Come to me. And I will give you rest. I can't believe my ears. I stand there stunned as God and Jesus look at me, laughing at the other end, not laughing at me, but out of pure joy because of what they have made me become and what I will be in the future. So walking, running, stumbling over myself, I made my way down to the throne, unaware of all those all around me, smiling and applauding. Finally, I arrive, my face still looking downward, with tears beginning to roll down my my cheeks. I start to say, Father God, I'm so sorry for all I've done against you and others. Please forgive me. I'll try and do better. God gently very gently, brings my face up until I look into his eyes and his incredible loving smile. And he says, I forgive you. You belong here with us. Welcome home. Let us pray. Gracious God, when we look at some of the imagery from that wonderful book of Hebrews. It is easy for us to be blown away. It is easy for us to see all these things and struggle to imagine them all together. But Lord, they are the other truth. You are glorious. You have sent Jesus and he is glorious. But he is also one of us. He's been one of us. He knows what it is. And he sits at your right hand and he intercedes for us. We thank you for that. Something we couldn't have asked for, something we could never have guessed probably is as uh, uh, in the time that he was, had his ministry on earth with us. But Lord, thank you for who he is. Thank you for what he continues to do for us. Lord, we pray that we will be ready for you to lead us forward into forgiveness, that you would enable us to invest more and more into that relationship with with you, that you would be uh, first and foremost in our minds, that we forget our little rebellions, our sin, pursuing those sort of things in whatever way, 
and allow you to be the Lord of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.